The following is brought to you by the Starfleet Podcast Network, SPN, The Spin. Mondays feel like that scene in Doomsday Machine when Decker is flying a shuttle for the Doomsday Machine yeah. and the music and he's, yeah, you yeah. know, all that stuff. And yeah. <laughs> that's what Mondays are like. I am Big J. I'm here with Paul Jock and Joshua Irwin. So we're doing a fan film production roundtable where we get together with a couple of uh, fan film creators, actors, writers, directors, producers, and so forth. And I want to thank you guys for being able to come in and join this evening. I really appreciate you taking out the time to sit and talk with me about this. And The first thing that I want to ask, which I think is going to be the first question for any of these roundtables, I did it for the the first one I did. What in the hell possesses you to spend all this time and money on Star Trek fan film productions? That is Uh, what I want to know. (laughs) Let the senior, I'll go. I'll go last. Josh has got a much interest, more interesting story. Let's hear the insanity. Uh, What what possessed me? Um, Just passion. You know, it's. You could say the same thing about any kind of art. You know, art is about pursuing passion. People pursue the things that they care about and they love that that bring joy and happiness into their lives. And, you know, anything that that you want to do that'll make you happy, make a difference in your life uh, comes with some work, with some risk, with some you got to gamble something. Um, one one example I always like to talk about is we had an actor in our film, The Needs of the One, named Cora Wilson. And in real life, she is a martial arts teacher. And before she was the owner of a martial arts school and an actress in our film, she was a cage fighter. Oh, and yeah. So she would she would go fight in, you know, mixed martial arts cage fights. And she talked about how hard that was, um, you know, training all the time to 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 be prepared for that. And one of the things that she brought up while we were all talking about it on a shoot one time is that she had to do things like meal plan on Thanksgiving. She couldn't have like Thanksgiving dinner with her family. She had to like meal plan that day. Cause she's like, you know, you have to have a, be, a, be at a certain health level weight and stuff like that for a fight. And so that kind of commitment level is like anything that you really get passionate about and you do um, to an excellent level, people in your life are going to be going, what are you, why are you doing this? You know, um, if you're going to go fight in a, a martial arts cage fight, if you're going to start a business, if you're going to become an artist, a musician, whatever it is, requires a sacrifice of time, sacrifice of money, whatever. And really, it's passion that, that leads you to want to do that. I love doing this. I love Star Trek and making Star Trek fan films. Um, I don't think I'm going to at least... Uh, I don't think I'm going to spend much more time paying for it and producing it and having the hassle of doing it. I think I'm going to stop doing that for a while after the next two films. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into working on other people's films because I found that I really like that. You know, when you make your own film, uh, gosh, it's, you know, there's nothing like it, but there's so much stress, so much money. You're worrying about every little thing. And when you can go and work on somebody else's film, you just show up and have a good time shooting a fan film and let them worry about all the hard stuff. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I've been, I've been pushing myself for five years doing this. And when I started out, um, I had a lot more money. Uh, I had a really good job pre pandemic yeah. and then the pandemic wiped that job out. And so like it was, you know, to keep Avalon universe alive over the course of the pandemic, it was really about how much do you want it? And, uh, I, I, I did everything you can think of worked in indie film, uh, you know, donated plasma, you name it to, to keep it going, had some, some donors that helped us out, uh, in some really hard times. And oddly enough, now that I'm almost done with it, all of that income that I had before the pandemic is starting to come back right when I don't really need it anymore. So at least that fan figure. Film. So it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. But you know, I'll I'll cut it off for a while and and recover. Um, but you know, uh, anything in life that's worth doing well, 
you know, it, it, it takes a sacrifice of something, time, effort, money, energy, whatever it is. It just depends on how bad you want it. That's very well said. I like that. Paul, I'd like to hear your take. Uh, it's, it's a love of track. I mean, we've thought about doing other, other fan projects, but, um, uh, Vance and I, Vance is a mutual friend of Josh and, and, uh, myself. So we met, uh, in a Facebook costume group during the pandemic. And, uh, Vance and I are both, uh, serial costume collectors, okay. I guess is probably a good, a good term. Uh, I'm a, a theater professor out here. And so, uh, I'm used to being in costume. I've been in costume for over 30 years. And, uh, is a lot of Star so, Trek costumes, uniforms are just all over different properties. Well, yeah, my, my Star Trek collection is, is grown, but there's, okay. uh, there's some Doctor Strange. There's a lot of Star Wars. Sure. Okay. Uh, there's, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's kind of, you know, Halloween is our, the theater people's holiday. It's like a national holiday for theater people. Uh, oh, nice. so, um, we met and I started kind of like the reverse of what Josh is talking about. I started doing Vance's films as, as, uh, Anthony Lobato. And then, um, uh, you know, he started, well, what would Lobato say here? And I started writing some stuff for Vance and I'm like, well, you know what? I have these couple of scripts that we could modify because I, uh, we had actually, it's a, it's a bad backwards way we went about it. We had actually shot one that just got released called foothold. And it was, um, it was going to be a standalone, just a one off just to get it out of our system. Cause there's a bunch of actors out here like, okay, we'll do a film. And so, um, when Vance and I started talking, it's like, well, we could work, you know, the supervillain phantom into this, and this really makes these six episodes work. And so we started filming the six, and then I started writing, and six between became twelve, and then twelve became eighteen, and uh, now we have twenty six scripted episodes. We're shooting into season three, so um, uh, it's kind of become, you know, you talked about Doomsday Machine. This is like obsession. Because now we have uh, 26 episodes for Raincross scheduled. We have uh, 12 completely shot and we're halfway through season three. And it's just be, became, be, I mean, it, when, when Josh talks about passion, it really is this passion project. Uh, <laughs> because we want to see the project finished. We want to see it to its, its conclusion. We, you know, um, there, there's a little bit of like, well, I wasn't a big fan of discovery. So, you know, we kind of fixed some things discovery did and wasn't a big fan of the first two seasons of Picard, big fan of season three. So we kind of started putting stuff in that, that filled the gaps for Picard. And it's just been, we, we have a big ensemble. We're kind of like Josh for Josh just knows everybody. And so we have a big ensemble too, where we have, you know, the rain cross crew. And um, so we actually shot, the season three bridge stuff on bridge pieces that we put into my theater and lit it up. And I mean, it's, it becomes this thing where you, you this community grows around you sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's really, no matter what happens when you get together with your crew, it is your crew. And it's, it's not really doing it for anybody else other than, than you. You know, and at the end of the day, when we're done with the shoot, we just shot last weekend, two days of shooting. And it's like, okay, when's the next shoot? When's the next shoot? And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's I kind of a way to, to live our dreams too. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, cause um, when I was 18, I met Michael Dorn and probably one of the biggest regrets of my life. I, it was at a convention out here in Pasadena and I, I was Young and thin before I discovered pizza. <laughs> you know, I, I think we all were that Dorn. way. <laughs> yeah. And Michael Dorn is just this large human being. And I told him I was a theater major. He's all, well, you, you're in good shape. Here's the number for central casting. Call them Monday and they'll get you in. And my car pooped out and I didn't have enough gumption. I was 18. I'm like, well, this will happen again. <laughs> no. And, you know, it didn't. It didn't, of course. You know, oh, so, that's I a mean, phone number you should have called right then and there, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, 18, 18, do a lot of things and you're, you know, dumb and stupid in 18. Yeah. You know, so it's this kind of way to, to our, make our contribution. I, I think Josh is the one who actually posts this on Facebook where 
um, Rod Roddenberry had said, you know, somebody asked him what's canon. He said all of it. And you kind of have this out of body experience at that point. It's like Avalon is canon. Hmm. Constar is canon and Raincross is canon. And oh my God. You know, it's just like this moment where you have this, this really, you're part of this, this bigger thing at the same time too. You feel like you're really a part of the franchise with something like that, with that kind of statement. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say so. That's got to be know, very encouraging. Yeah. You know, Paul, Paul and I actually met at STLV in 2021 and yes. Vance was there with us and uh, they did a whole thing on fan films where they had Scott Mance from Access Hollywood come out and interview us about our fan films that we were making. And, and I told Vance, I said, think about this for a second. You are going to be interviewed on the same stage as other Star Trek actors, real Star Trek actors. That makes you a Star Trek actor. You know, you're, you're every bit as much a Star Trek actor as any of these people. Your, your character is, means just as much as Kirk or Picard or anybody. You have your own corner of the Star Trek universe that no one can ever take away from you. And, and we had a chance to screen some films there. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. And this is, this is our way of just, you know, having our own piece of this thing that we love, this optimistic version of the future to tell stories. Um, Paul brought up Rod Roddenberry. We met him there and he watched one of our films and was, was very sweet about it. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's in, and I think that the neatest thing about this, this newest generation of fan film producers is that we're all embracing each other. We're all considering each other's creations to be canon. You know, um, we're looking at, you know, Rain Cross is canon, Constar is canon, somehow they all connect. And instead of there being some kind of rivalry, we're all starting to recognize that everybody gets joy and happiness from, from making a Star Trek fan film and everybody deserves that. And if we all support each other in that, then we can share in that joy and happiness together. That's one of the things that I saw already pretty quickly as I began getting more into the fan film atmosphere and my introduction to it. And I've, I've always watched fan films, but haven't been part of an actual community like that. And as I was going through Facebook and seeking out to meet more Star Trek related people to expand that mutual connection, because I, I wanted to see if there was more out there. You know, my, my regular friends list was not a lot of Star Trek fans really. Uh, but I wanted to really kind of enhance that. And that's when I came across Vance and Frank and did interviews with them and they got me into this whole thing. I mean, it was, I've, I've already had a scene that I filmed for one of the fan films, one of those, you know, a view screen scene. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's, I've, I've always thought about that. Like I've always wanted to be in a fan film and now that's happening, which is like, it's pretty cool because I've got a, a cell phone it's got the video on it. I've, I've got an actual video camera. I've got a couple uniforms, things like that, that I got just for the podcast. And that was one of the things that Vance was saying when we were, when we talked is that anyone can do this. Yeah. There is no one telling you that you can't, you're not, you don't have an agent. You don't have a casting process. You don't have any of that stuff. You can just go out. It's like with podcasting. No one can tell you that you can't do it. No one. I didn't have to interview for a job or anything like that. I just decided I'm going to have a microphone. I'm going to upload it, the thing. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's grown and developed since then. You have your own stuff so yeah. you can do it. And I've got to tell you, this community has been very welcoming. I've met a lot of nice people, which is is very, uh, very encouraging because it's, it's fun. I like being in something that people really like to do because this is all a great passion for us in a hobby. We have, this is something that we all 
have uh, in common. And yeah. it's one of those things. And I, every fandom has this, I would imagine, but with Star Trek, you can walk through a door, any door. It doesn't matter who you are, background, religion, political views, race, creed, whatever it is. Everyone is then suddenly we're Star Trek fans in the same room mm -hmm. with the same passion, the same like wanting to, wanting to do the same thing. And it seems like it's it's really worth putting the time and money into it. And uh, what I'm curious about is some of you guys that I've talked to sounds like there's a lot of films being turned out. How do you how do you guys do that? How how, is, how are there so many that are out there? I just I didn't I didn't understand that there was such a volume of fan films because the way I look at looked at it was it probably takes a couple months or more, maybe half year to film one episode. But how do you guys do this? Josh, should we go first? Should we go first? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, you know, well, for us, um, you know, mileage may vary, I guess. You know, it's it's a situation where uh, it depends on the film, you know, for us. Like, for example, the very first one we ever did, Ghost Ship, um, we filmed that in uh, three days. And then we released it six weeks later, um, you know, back in... Uh, 2022, when we did Needs of the One, we shot that in four shooting days and released that in two months. Um, same could be said for like Cosmic Stream. We did that in four shooting days and released that four or five months later. Um, now, the ones we're working on now, it's a different story. Uh, Crisis on Infinite Excaliburs, which I'm working on right now. Uh, took a break to to come do this from from the editing. Um, yeah, we started shooting it a year ago, over a year ago, and um, didn't you know didn't even finish hiccup shots on it until uh, uh, two weeks ago, something like that. So, uh, and we were going to release it this coming week, but decided you know everybody looked at it, and my CG artist Sam Cockings, who's also uh, an excellent fan film producer in his own right came to me and said, you know, this is, this is such a great film. And I have some ideas for some layers we could add. And Sam made a pitch. He's like, we could add a layer here. We could add a layer there, but it may take a few more weeks. And he sold me on it. And I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's do the best job we possibly can. And so, you know, we're going to push the release of our film back a couple of weeks. Um, but it's, you know, normally it is a, shoot it, release it a few months later, this time around, yeah, we're, we're taking an entire year to make a film. But then we had some other films that, that we worked on that like we had shot last year that they got completed in the interim. And so we had things we've, we've released three things already this year. Uh, and so crisis will be like the, it'll be like the fourth release of the year. Um, so, but, but we started shooting it over a year ago. So it just depends on how much you want to put into it. I think that a lot of the volume of content has to do with, there are a lot of great people doing it. Um, there's a part in crisis on infinite Excaliburs that calls out to a lot of other fan filmmakers. And in looking out there, it blows my mind how many there are. You know, um, there are people doing this all over the world in the UK, in Europe, in Australia. Yeah, because it's Melbourne, right? So, yeah, so many. There's um, you got Starship Intrepid in Scotland. Yep. You've got Sa you got Sam Cockings doing Trek shorts in in the UK, but you also have Greg Locke making uh, Star Trek fan films in the UK. You've got uh, uh, Uderon Infinity. You have FS Film in the Czech Republic. Right, you they're have, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you've got uh, Squadron was also in the Czech Republic. You've right. got uh, Batavia, I think. I, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, but Batavia. Uh, you've got These Are the Voyages in Australia. Yeah. And in the U.S., you have you have Dreadnought Dominion. You have Federation Files. You have Tales from the Neutral Zone. You have Constar. You have um, Rain Cross. You have Manchester. You have uh, Crossroads Project Gemini. 
you have, I, I, I don't, uh, you have, uh, Potemkin pictures and they've got like three different series, three or four series of their own. It's just, like a lot of people doing stuff. It's, it's almost hard to keep track of it all. You know, I don't but, know how you're able to name all those. Like, that was, that was fantastic right there. <laughs> right. And that's not even counting like the grandfather of, of fan films for Star Trek was like new voyages and Star Trek continues. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably where we all started. Yeah. yeah. New Voyages continues and uh the Hidden right. Frontier w- right. was Frontier. was a big one in in yeah. all of that. That's like when I discovered YouTube, you know what yeah. I mean in 2006 yeah. where it was like what's YouTube? <laughs> one of the one of the first things I started watching were Star Trek fan films, like watching Hidden Frontier and watching Star Trek New Voyages where I was like, man, these guys have a bridge. Yeah. You yeah, know, that was pretty like cool. I, I was watching that going, these guys built a bridge and yeah. little did I know that I'd be filming on it one day. So, uh, you know, I, I used to sit around and think, man, I wish I could be a part of this. I wish I could do to do this. And the shame of it all is that I never for a long time thought that I could, I thought I wouldn't do it very well. I was like, yeah, I, I could try and do this, but I just embarrassed myself and I wouldn't make a very good fan film. A lot of self doubt in it. And it was Vance who is the person that inspired me? No, do it. Because when I saw Vance, he was just like doing it in his backyard, man. He was, he was grabbing a, even the early days, he was just grabbing a phone. Yeah. He was grabbing his friends. They were going back in the woods. They were making some film that was like a, a an away team or something. Dude, he had Pizza Hut in the background. You could see it. It didn't matter. <laughs> and, and, it, right. and it was this thing where, where he just, I, I feel like he was a more courageous filmmaker than me because he didn't, he didn't sit around and wonder about it. He didn't sit around and go, should I do this? Or will anyone watch this? Or he just wanted to do it and he just did it. And I, I was, I was seeing him post these films. I didn't know the guy from a can of paint mm-hmm. and I'm seeing him post these films. And I was like, man, this guy's doing it. This guy's living the dream. And I, I just, commented like congratulations or something on one of his films. And then a friend requested me. Then we're talking Then we're talking on the phone. And before I know it, he's like, you should, you should make a Star Trek fan film. And then we were doing it. And, and that is, that is the impact that Vance has had on so many people in the, in this, you know, you talk about him saying anyone can do it. That's the mindset that he pioneered, that anybody could do it, that anybody could be a part of it. And um, he's, you know, he may not talk about it. He may not really take credit for it. But if you think about what he's doing right now, he's not making his own films. He has taken his channel and his audience and his experience, and he has opened it up Mm -hmm. to other people, to Frank, to Paul to uh, Starship Manchester and said, this is a forum. This is a place for Star Trek fan films. Right. And, and for like, for example, uh, there are these two people, I think they were a married couple. I don't know who they are, but they made this film that was like lost on a planet or something. And it was just like, they were in their basement and they filmed on a green screen and they like had their scripts in their hands, whatever he, he put it on his channel. And so it's like anybody, he, he has created a forum for people to be in fan films. It's altruistic and it's amazing. That is amazing. Paul, what's, what's your impression on just the sheer output of, of these films? What, what because is start? Well, you know, Cause I think Star Trek is such a big palette, right? Yeah. Because you go all the way from enterprise through Picard season three and it's hundreds of years. And I I don't know. I'm kind of one of these fans that takes modern history and future history very seriously. Yeah. So there's there's hundreds of years and there's quadrants and there's open space. And it's kind of like what Sam, Sam Cockings, you know, Josh talked about him, you know, with being able to have these little mini vignettes. Right. And then if you put in mirror dimensions, then you've got, you know, Avalon, which is just a little bit of a split and, that's the thing that Roddenberry and the the successive writers and showrunners have done is they've created this huge palette that everybody can play in, right? Because no one starship can ever encompass any all the stories, right? And classic Trek. I mean, the thing 
because I'm 51. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm a little bit older. And so I, I watched the first set of reruns. I was babysat by my older sisters and I watched the, the TOS reruns. And the thing about growing up and then getting into like preteen and teenage years is, well, whatever happened to the Gorn? Whatever happened to Trelane? Whatever happened to this? Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to this? And I think that's part of the fan film thing is like, the, you know, they always teach you in creative writing and, and writing is big what if, right? And so with, with this, it's like you take one little what if and you expand it, right? And you go back and you do a callback to something that was before. And Star Trek has so many episodes, right? Plus the feature films. And you wonder about, well, what is this a- alien race doing? What is that one doing? What, you know? Yeah. And so I think everybody really has their own version of a five-year mission. I mean, you go back to the original narration, you're like, okay, what would I do with the five-year mission? Yes. Where would I go? What would I do? Well, you know, and it's, it's just, yeah. you lay awake at night because it's all, you know, you have this feeling that like, you're out there with your writing and your acting, exploring the final frontier, you know? And so it's just kind of mind boggling, right? You know, what happened to Captain Cisco? What are the prophets really like? You know, what are the Bajorans like when they go out into space and finally get a chance to see, you know, and it's just, it's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. So I, I think that's, that's it. I mean, we shoot a little bit different than, than Josh. We, we are serialized. So when we shoot a season, we do one day per location. And so like last weekend I said was all the bridge stuff. So we, we shot all of our bridge stuff in one day. Yeah. And, um, uh, I think the 11th, the 12th, we have, you know, it's, we, we, because we're serialized, we, we shoot on a film schedule. So it's all done, uh, on location based on location. And so, uh, we're able to knock out an entire six, episode season in about 16 to 18 total days of shooting because we're able to do it location wise. Um, although we don't have the cool bells and whistles of, of the, the set back there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, so, I mean, every, that's the thing is everybody has their own, their own way and their own flavor of doing it too. I mean, you're not really, you know, you're, you're not part of, any production company other than your own. And so there's nobody really telling you, you know, what the schedule is other than like Josh and, and myself who are kind of end up being showrunners and Vance who's like the big, the big showrunner with all the opportunities given. But I mean, Frank is able to do his own thing and uh, you know, Gary and it, you know, you, you do it when, when you can and uh, you tell the stories that you want to tell. And that's a very good example because when I talk to Ray, if uh, Ray tests you down at neutral zone, talk with him and uh, he prompted me with, with this idea of writing a treatment for a a Star Trek story as a possible fan film. And uh, it was the, just coming up with the idea and having something to collaborate with a friend of mine on and to write some things and just kind of playing that, that film in your head. If anything, I think it's a great creative outlet and ho- hopefully he'll read it and like it and we'll make this a thing. I I'm hoping so, which, uh, you know, keep your fingers crossed for me on that. I think it's a great idea. I don't want to give too much away about it, but, uh, you know, but here's the I, thing. It's your idea. Yeah, yeah. It's your take on it. So do it for you. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, I love watching Josh's stuff and Tyler's a great captain and you know, all your crew is amazing. And so, I mean, you, you've discovered it that, you know, everybody is able to tell their story. So tell your story. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, the challenge was playing a part of, of Captain Cisco and mm-hmm. getting him incorporated onto a, um, a 2260s Constitution class ship. And that the main thing was, okay, how do I, how do I accomplish this 
without retreading the same old Q intervention, time travel thing, transporter right. accident, and that kind of thing. And it's just trying to come up with with something that is that is different and creative and maybe not not thought about is uh, yeah. is is a lot of fun. You know, to, you never know. So you mentioned Cisco in a twenty sixties constitution. I I got to say that I had the biggest crush when DS9 came out on Terry Farrell. It's not even like yeah. kosher. <laughs> and you know, she, she yeah. had that great line. Oh, he's so good looking. Kirk? No, Spock. You know, it's yeah. just like, oh my God, Terry <laughs> Farrell. Dude, and, and, and Jefferson, you go, go make your film. And then, you know, there's a, there's a fan film channel ready for you to post it on and, yeah. you know, no budget productions. Yeah. You know, ready-made audience. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I think is another big plus. And it, so you mentioned something pretty interesting there. Now, do you guys, when you make, when you make a fan film, do you guys like kind of, um, share it with each other to, to post on your respective YouTube channels? Uh, like for example, I'll just use the Federation files as an example. Uh, if they create a fan film, is it, uh, so like, and then they give it to say tales from the neutral zone. Is that something you guys do or it's like you, you post each other stuff on your, your channels or is it pretty much you're in the, you're in your own lane? It just, it just depends on who it is. Uh, I don't think you'd ever see a Federation files posted on a neutral zone YouTube channel. Right. But, um, Uh, just trying to use an example, you know, I'm probably not putting it in Uh, correct words, but you know what I'm saying. But you will see tales from the neutral zone posted on Avalon. Right. Uh, on the Avalon channel as well. Um, because, you know, they have, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a place where the, the film could be posted to get a bigger audience. So like, yeah. uh, we posted the lost starship on the Avalon channel and it's gotten almost a hundred thousand views and that's a tales from the neutral zone. And so, um, whereas Vance may take some of my episodes and post them on his channel as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm fine with that. Like I'd never tell him no, like he asks, but he does it anyway. And that's fine. So you, you see a little bit of that. Um, and you, and you see, uh, like, for example, squadron is posted on the Axonar channel. Um, there are episodes like starship Farragut and, and other fan films posted on Vance's channel. So yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of cross pollination there, but you know, like for example, these are the voyages is only going to be on their channel or, um, you know, Potemkin pictures, you're only going to be able to find their stuff on their channel. That's fine. There's, there's no like set way you have to do it. Uh, I would say that, that if you're going to see a cross pollination of films, it's usually because those people are working together and they're really good friends. And so they're, they're fine with doing that. Like Ray Tessie's fine with me posting tales from the neutral zone on the Avalon channel because it gets the studio more exposure. Right. And that's another, another interesting thing that you brought up that ties into something that I talked to with the first group when, when we did the first round table is that the likes and the views, well, not really the likes, the views are our currency. That is mm-hmm. how we see that we're getting that return on that time and effort spent for you yeah. guys. And I'll start with, with you, Paul, do you feel like, like, yes, this, this is the currency. This shows, this is what I work for is to get those views. And, <laughs> Do you enjoy it if you get 200 views as much as if you get 2000? Is there, what's, what's that level that makes you feel like, okay, yes, this is my box office return was a thousand views. And that's, that's where I was hoping, <laughs> hoping to be. Yeah. I mean, you always hope that somebody's, somebody's going to enjoy it past, you know, you and, and your kids. I mean, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I don't know that we really, prioritize views. Uh, I know it sounds weird. Um, I mean, I guess coming from a theater and film background, um, you do it because you love it. I mean, I could have done more film in my career, but I did more stage because I wanted to 
do the stories that I wanted to tell. Are you reading somewhere? And so um, that's something that I, I mean, it's, it's fun. It's definitely fun uh, to, to see when, when they are well-received. I think that that's fun, you know, cause uh, there is a, I guess there is a point of validation that comes when you get the, the views. I think that there's definitely something. So I should say that you don't do it for the views, but the views are validation. Okay. It's like uh, doing a show when you're in a 300 seat theater and there, there's more people in the audience there are in the cast than it, it is validation that you know people <laughs> want to see your show. Uh, I've, I've done the opposite. You know, I, I used to perform the Renaissance fairs, and uh, there was one very hot day where there were three people in my troupe and two people in the audience. It's like, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, um, it, it's it's kind of feel like, what is this for? What do we? Why are we doing yeah. this? You know. So I mean, it's it's. It, I guess it is neat when you see that you you the, the views are coming. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense that it's a two-edged sword. It, it does. It definitely makes sense. You're right. You're not doing it for the views, but it, it does help you feel good. Right. It, it was like, you know, I, there was a theater producer out here a few years back that was like, well, and, and we, it's an awards night and here we are. This is why we do it. And it's like, well, if you're doing it for the awards, you're probably not doing it for the right reason. You know, it's it's like, if you ever played sports, they say play sports for the name on the front of the jersey rather than the rear of the jersey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's priorities. Well, Josh, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, when I when I do a podcast episode, I don't do it for the views, but I honestly it, it feels good when you post something and you get you get those likes or get those views. And I wish more likes turned into views, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I got as many yeah. views as I got likes, <laughs> yeah. But you're right. It it kind of shows if if people are watching it outside of your immediate family, then it feels good that you've gotten someone's attention to look yeah. at that. Josh, how do you feel about that? Well, well, my immediate family doesn't watch it, so uh, <laughs> like, so you don't have I, that built like, in three views for everything you do. I'd be like, hey, <laughs> hey, mom, you gonna you gonna watch my film or what? Oh, sorry, sweetheart. I- I haven't had time to do it yet. I'm like, 10,000 other people watched it before my mom did. Um, <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> it, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because you, you made this comparison of, you know, currency. And the thing that it made me think of was when I, you know, you can't, you can't monetize these fan film YouTube channels. Right, right. So, but I, but I looked at, you know, the possible earnings, like it'll give you a quote of what you would earn if you did it. And, and, and what I saw from Avalon is, is that I would break even, I would, I would get the money back (laughs) if if I could monetize it, which that's awesome. (laughs) um, So, uh, but, but, you know, Hey, look, it's nice. You know, it's nice. Everyone likes that. It's, it's nice to see that, that people, want to see it. And, you know, while you're making it, it's not something you're thinking of because, you know, if, if, if you're an artist, that idea comes to you and you talked about like visualizing the film in your head and seeing it, Oh, here's this idea playing out. And, and so you get, you get really into that. You get really into that creation and you get so into the creation that it's like nothing else matters. It's yeah. and and then when you put it up, it's like oh, people like it or don't. You know, it's it's like when we made Ghost Ship, I didn't know what was going to happen. Oh. I, you know, for me, right. it was it was it was honestly just oh. about making it, and and I thought, you know, we'll go make this thing, we'll post it. And five years later, maybe it has 6,000 views and, and we're looking at it going, man, remember when we made that Star Trek fan film? That was a lot of fun. And we posted it and got half a million views. And so it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then we started making more and, and those are getting hundreds of thousands. And, and no, I didn't expect that. I really, really didn't. Um, glad it happened. And it, and it, what I will say about the value of the view count. Yes. It's validating that people watch it. People like it when, when half a million people watch your film, they must like it 
or they would that many people wouldn't be watching. Um, and we, you know, you can look at the, the, uh, the ranking of it. So like, you know, you go into the analytics and it says likes versus dislikes or whatever, and you're getting, you know, 96, 97% positive ratings. Um, that's encouraging. And then, you know, out of a half a million views, you might get 2000 comments or, or something like that. And, and out of those 2000 comments, you might get you know, 51 that are somebody going, this sucks. <laughs> so you got to keep You, you took the time out of your day to make sure you made that comment. I'll take that as a plus because that means that you were, you were one more person <laughs> that devoted it time. It mattered enough. It yeah. mattered enough to say something. <laughs> yeah, so, it's, it's a know, Jack yeah. Sparrow sort of thing. Like, you were the worst part I've ever seen uh, or heard of. Yeah, but you have heard of me, right? <laughs> right. If you remember... <laughs> Yeah. And, and, but, you know, yeah, it's, it's great. I didn't, I didn't think it would have that kind of, of, of traction. And what it's done for us more than just being a number is that it, it linked us to people all over the world. We got, I've gotten to meet people all over the world. I would have never met Paul at Star Trek Las Vegas mm. uh, if it weren't for fan films. I never would have met so many people that I met. I, before I did Star Trek fan films, um, I was trying to do an indie film project and I couldn't get anybody behind it. I want to do a football movie mm -hmm. and I couldn't get anybody to support it. It was depressing. And I was like, man, and I, I was like, this movie, if it got made, it makes $30 million, but I can't get anybody to, to get behind it. And it was so frustrating. And then you, you go make a Star Trek fan film and you get some dude you've never even met. Uh, reaching out to you, hey man, I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars. You know, some some guy from Cleveland, Ohio that <laughs> you never would have ever known this person. Yeah. Just like I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars. Well, hey, let's be friends. And then the guy comes down. You you find out he's at big into karate, and you're doing karate together and hanging out and eating sushi, and and suddenly the guy's your friend. Uh, it's crazy how this works. Now, this is going to be a good one, I think. This is going to be one of my this is going to be one of my good question days. Tell me oh tell me what you think of this one. All right. If there is one film that you did that you were a part of that you could delete, which one would it be and why? <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, what, wait, which is, is Star, a Star Trek film? Star Trek fan film. No, one of oh. your one of your fan films that you were. Now you have you have to be involved in it. It can't be someone else's completely. They said, "Yeah, that was a stinker." It needs to be one that you either uh, starred in, you had a role in, you produced it, edited, directed, written. In some way, you were actually part of that. If there was one that you could just say, no, don't like this one, didn't like it, I'd like to delete it, but I'm a completist and we have to keep all our stuff on the channel, which one would it be and why? Um, for me, uh, that's that's a question that has a few layers to it. If it's if it's somebody else's project, you know, there's never any shame there because it's like um I, I enjoyed being a part of everybody's other productions. And it's like, those are treasured memories shooting with the Federation files, shooting with um, dreadnought dominion, shooting with Constar, some of my most treasured memories of fan films. Um, I have, I don't know if the word delete is, is the right term, but I have stopped and started over. Like I have done shooting days for films. I've done three separate shooting days on a film on two different films where I went, this is not going the way that I wanted it. And, um, I think, I think that we need to change what we're doing. And so I have, I have films where I have three different versions of a scene played by different actors. Um, where I said, where I stopped production on a film and started over. So, um, I have sort of to a degree deleted something and started over. I've never, you know, I don't, I can't look at any of the Avalon films and say, 
Um, I wish I could just get rid of that one. There, there, there are lessons you learn. There are decisions that I made on a lot of the films that I wish I could take back, like needs of the one. Um, I, I would handle this wig situation. You know, this, the actress was wearing just like the worst wig ever. And I was like, I hate this. And I, I, I feel like it ruins the film. And if, and if I had to do it again, I would approach that situation differently. But oddly enough, I did that differently with the the film we did next, where um, we shot a day and the makeup person couldn't be there and the wig on a different actress didn't look very good. And I kept looking at it going, I don't want to have this regret again. And so I went back to the actress. I went back to the makeup person. I said, we're going to reshoot this because this wig is just, I'm not putting this in my film. And they got another wig and cut it and styled it and got it where it needed to be. And we reshot all that actor's material. Um, you know, there is a film that I did on, and it's an Avalon film that if I were to be magically transported back to that time period, I would not make, I would just say to heck with this, no need to even make this. And I would just not make it. Um, I'm not going to say which one it is and I'm not going to say why, but if, <laughs> if I had, if I had to do it over again, I would just simply not make that film. I spent $11,000 on it. Mm. Um, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the film. It's still on the channel. I'm not going to take it down. But, but if, if I were to live those events over again, I would make it. I would just move on and, and, and do something else. Okay. Well said. Paul, you got, you had a little bit of time to think there, Josh, hopefully helped you out. Yeah. You know, I, I think building off of Josh saying, I think that it's the components of things because, um, we, we've tried because, because the original director and cinematographer backed out after having delayed and delayed and delayed, we're just like, screw it. We can shoot on the phone. We can do this. We can do that. And um, we got some interesting advice on our original bridge set for season two that if I had known that one of our cast members could be as gifted in design and fakery as he is, like with scene design, yeah. uh, we would have made this, the, bri the bridge that we just shot on for season two, but that was already shot and we used a lot of green screen. We'll see how it turns out. Um. But I think the other thing too is that even having shot on the the cell phone, all of a sudden now we have videographers that have cameras and lights, and they're coming in. It's changing how it's going back to the original how we thought it was going to be. Um, so I guess kind of like what Josh is saying, there's no going back, right? And it's kind of tough because they're all your children. I mean, they're they're all yeah. a piece of you, and they're. they're really something to be treasured. Uh, but I think that, yeah, <laughs> you know, would, would TOS like to go back and reshoot some of their monster effects? Sure. <laughs> like, part of the charm, you know, Mugatu is the Mugatu. It's going to be the Mugatu forever. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the doomsday machine is a windsock that's, that's concrete. And, you know, there's just, you know, certain things that it's a charm and sure that we got remastered. But I mean, I think that if it's for us, I mean, because we have some great actors that I guess as the, the showrunner as the producer for rain cross, I think that I would have, I think that I would have asked more instead of taking it all on myself early on and embrace the community of what everybody could have brought to the table. And we probably could have had a more complete storytelling experience from the get go. But I was, I don't know. I was kind of afraid that I didn't know that if people would invest the same way I was investing. And as it turns out, they, they, they're, they're really very much into it. I mean, Pierre with the carpentry and Jacob who plays Cyrock, the other Vulcan, all the stuff that he's brought in, you know, beyond the uniform, you know, our stunt guy, Richard is great. I mean, all this stuff, you know, we have, one person, I have a couple of that aren't on camera, like Tara and Pat. And they're, mm -hmm. they're great ads, and you know, if I had asked earlier, we probably would have had a lot better craft services tables. You know, so I mean, <laughs> just I, I think it's uh, to your question. I think it's just 
I don't know that I would ever delete an episode, but I would do things differently. Um, because just like, just like every captain realizes at some point, it's the, it's the crew that makes the ship, not the ship that makes the crew. So it sounds like you and guys that- don't necessarily have a code of honor episode that you'd like to not have done. There's no uh, Sub Rosa in Rain Cross. No. Good. Okay. No Sub Rosa, no code of honor. <laughs> I, you know, look, I, there, there's an episode that I basically undid. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not, I, and I can look at that, that film. It's a good film. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the work that we did on it. I thought it told a really good story, but, um, there, there was a film that we did that I never planned to do. That was, you know, I had, I had two people who participated in Avalon who behind the scenes were not friends and did not get along. And, and it was kind of a, one person had to go and one person had to stay and a choice was made. And so we made a, a film where a character died and I got a little down the road and decided I'd made the wrong choice. And so I brought that character back. So I made a film to bring that character back. And for me, I wouldn't call it so much a, uh, a code of honor or a sub Rosa, more a um, skin of evil yesterday's enterprise kind of situation where it's like, you know, because this happened, we were able to turn it into a story. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like we told a really beautiful story with how we brought some of these characters back. And, and I was proud of that. And it was, and it was a very beautiful thing. And, and that, that film actually brought back two characters that had been killed. And I remember when I wrote the script, um, at the end of it, and it, and it would mean nothing on screen. It wouldn't translate on screen. I just wrote it for me. When the, you know, I, I write the scene, these characters of a lot, they're alive. They've returned their, their journey continues. I wrote now anything is possible were the last words of the script. That's not something that's going to translate onto a screen specifically, but I did it for me and it meant something. And so it's like you make a mistake. That's normal. That's being human. And all of those films mean something to you. All of those experiences mean something to you. And even if you look back and you think that whether a creative choice was a mistake or, or you wish you had done something different, it doesn't matter. It's now part of what is and it, and you grew because, because of it. It's like, uh, to relate it to Star Trek, it's like Tapestry, the TNG episode Tapestry, yeah, okay. where where Picard talks about he wishes he could do this differently, and when he tried, he unraveled the tapestry, and and it would be the same thing. You know, you could go back and redo this or that, but the fact is, you learned and you grew because of that, and maybe that's more important than how good the film was because. That's not what matters. You know, if, if, if you take an attitude that what you make must be perfect or what you do must be perfect because of it, if it's not perfect, then you are not perfect. You're not going to be anything. You're going to be stuck. You're going to be on the bottom because you're never going to be able to rise. You're never going to be able to grow. And, and I relate a lot of things to martial arts because that's something that's also important to me. The most important thing you can do in a martial arts class is get your butt kicked. Yeah. Because it forces you to learn. Yeah. It forces you to grow. It forces you to look at yourself and go, okay, I made this mistake. How could I do it better next time? And you build on that. We're human. We're creating art. Art is subjective. Art is flawed. Everybody has a different opinion on it. That's fine take the lesson, move forward. I think failing can be a good thing. Uh, It is possible to commit no wrongs and still fail. And that is, that's, that's a part of life. And I think that when that happens, when you do something and it doesn't go well, that helps you to learn. So that way you're more prepared 
the next time if that happens it ha it's with real life a lot of times i would if if everything is going well and everything's perfect then i feel like this isn't right something is wrong it's it's almost like when you have extra money in your account you're thinking what did i forget to pay something has not been done because there's you you just you're filled with a sense of dread when you have when you have extra money or when you have extra free time what am i forgetting to do someone it needs to be picked up from somewhere or i need to go whatever you just you're it's almost like when things are well you're you kind of have this this feeling of uh this feeling of dread like you know something's going to happen i'd rather it go ahead and happen and there are certainly podcast episodes i've done that i look back on and think oh man what was i doing what was i thinking this is not only did i not have the technical know-how quite at the time but it was just this idea did not work it worked in my head but now i'm embarrassed didn't come out anywhere near what i what i felt it was going to and the views acknowledge that <laughs> they can <laughs> they confirm that it was a stinker but it, you know, that's the thing is I've, I've been able to hone my craft there by seeing what went wrong and what do I want to do better. Then you start learning things. Then you, you might get different film editing techniques. You, you'll, you'll get different ways you do graphics or images or acting, writing, whatever it is. And you learn from that. You learn and grow from that. So for you guys to have to be able to acknowledge and see there aren't there's, there's not so much full episodes that i did not like but there were components that i was able to learn from and the thing is that if you don't learn that then you keep doing it you, you keep making the same mistake and this leads me to my next question and discussion for me i've got this pact with my best friend uh, his name is ben he's an actor uh out of out of los angeles he will uh, give me his stuff like i made his demo reel his acting his voice reel that he uses with his agent to you know, to do auditions and one of the things that we promised to each other we've been best friends over 30 years over 35 years was that we were going to actually give real honest critique criticism or approval on something that we were not going to tell each other every time yeah it looks good because i can't tell you how many times i get that yeah it looks good sounds good it's it's great and yeah. the thing is is that when you when you get too many people telling you that because they they just want you to, they want you to feel good or they're, they're not, they're not vested in your success or your career. And what happens is you get to someone that is going to tell you if what you're doing is not good. And the problem is going to be, well, but wait a minute. Everyone keeps telling me that everything I do is good. Looks good. Sounds good. And all that. So what happened? Why, why is this person saying this? They must be crazy. Well, if you if you see something that is that can be a learning experience or correctable then that person needs to know that for example uh josh if every person say your your friends if you ask them hey how does this wig look on on this actor for this for the scene how much do you want to bet that you'd probably get a whole bunch of yeah it looks good and then you put it out there and you just get destroyed on the whole look of it and it, it ruins the film. Now, do, you, do you guys ever come across that or, or feel like? I guess it, I guess it would depend on who I asked. Yes. And, and um, I know, I know that there are people that will be honest with me. So for example, again, going back to martial arts, you know, um, which I need to get back to myself, but you know, I, if, if you're going to spar with somebody, it's like, choose the person that you know is going to just wreck you. 
you know, because mm-hmm. don't don't choose the opponent you know you can easily defeat. Choose the one that's going to wreck you. And uh, you know, with 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 the with the fan films, uh, I've learned to go to somebody I know is a, a huge critic, and that's Jonathan Lane. Because when I was making a film with Jonathan Lane, he would it was just notes and notes and notes, and I think we should do this and that, and he was really critical, and. And I hated it at the time. I was like, man, this guy is never satisfied. And, but interlude went on to be a, uh, that we made together ended up, you know, it's winning film festivals all over the world. And so I will go to Jonathan and I will show him a cut of a film and say, like crisis on X, infinite Excaliburs and say, what do you think? And I will go to Sam Cockings which, you know, it used to be in the beginning, Sam would offer his criticism and I wouldn't ask for it. And he would offer it anyway and make me mad. <laughs> and now, and now I go to Sam and I say, Hey, Sam, take a look at this cut and tell me what you think. And he comes back and he says, Hey, this is, you know, I looked at it and my thought is you could add this or you could add that. And suddenly it's a totally different thing. Instead of it being a criticism from some person, it's a team member who is bringing an idea to build upon a creation and you see it in a completely different light. And so I, I took crisis on infinite Excaliburs this past week and I showed it to several people and I, I asked everyone send me your thoughts and I was able to take those thoughts and see a pattern or see something in there that made sense to me and go, okay, I'm seeing this. They're seeing this. Then It lets me know, okay, this is something we can work on here. And it's something we can actually do something about. And so it's like a very great thing. Um, If you make a film and you put it out there, it's like, again, it's like going for a free roll in a jujitsu class. I mean, there's nothing but truth. You know, if you, if you go and you free roll with the guy, he's either going to choke you or he's not. And you're either good enough to stop him or you're not. And you put a fan film out there and you have a a YouTube channel that has 20,000 subscribers. People are going to be honest with you about what they think because they, they can do that on the internet. They, they've got that internet courage. And so it's like, you know, people people either don't like it or not. Internet courage. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So it's like, you might as well, you might as well dissect it yourself. And, And if, and if you just think, well, my movie's good and it doesn't matter. And you put it out there and then people start, if you can't face the, if you can't face the criticism and the notes while you're making the film, you're not going to be able to face it when it gets posted. So it's, it's, it's Mm -hmm. a matter of, yeah, if filmmaking is an act of courage, you've got to have a thick skin. Look, man, um, there are people that positively hate me because I did this people who have never met me in person that, that don't know anything about me that talk trash about me constantly. <laughs> um, twice a week are posting what an awful person I am. And they don't know anything about me. Right. They've never been on a film set with me. They don't know what it's like to work with me. And I'm the devil. <laughs> if you, if you make waves in the world, there's people will respond positively and people, and some people won't. And you just have to have the courage to accept that that's going to happen. Very well said. I like that. It's uh, funny you bring up Sam Cockings. I'm actually talking to him in a couple of weeks. So you're definitely looking forward to that one. Paul, what's your, your take on what Josh said? Uh, I think he's, he's right. I mean, it's a very collaborative process where, um, I mean, like, like him, I, I write the stuff, but when, uh, the first person that I usually have read is my wife, who is, who's a German. Uh, mm-hmm. and so German, my little German girl. So they usually have no filter as to whether it sucks or not. <laughs> You're going to so, hear it. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I turn it over to the two that are AD and, um, uh, and like script editor and just give me notes. And so like Josh says, if you don't get notes, there's something wrong. Right. Right. Uh, but I mean, if you've been in the film business enough, you know that the final cut is where the the, the final edit falls. And so, um, you know, it goes through Dan Breland, who's our excellent CGA I artist, and uh, Trey, who's our editor, and, and Vance. And it's you know, 
notes. How do you want this? Should we do this? Should we do this? Do we, do we need something else? Do we, you know? And so I think, you know, Josh has been around a long time and he knows that they, you, 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 you get a few voices you really trust and you get notes from them. And, um, <laughs> the other part of the business is that, uh, like he said, you have to have a thick skin because there's always going to be a, a couple of, Oh, I little Josh let a couple of very nice, not nice <laughs> people, uh, out there who, you know, it, I, you know, like I said, I, I've been drawing a check as a, as an, as a performer since I was 17. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you realize is that there's always going to be somebody else that's, that's denigrating your work just because. Just because they want they, to. They, they read your name somewhere and they don't like you. And it's like, okay, cool. After you, you, know, have, you have to for learn a while. to discern criticism. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the way that I look at it. Discern criticism. Yeah. Know when that criticism is valid. Yeah. There, there, there is a difference between somebody pointing out something that legitimately is an issue to be addressed versus somebody just something saying something mean spirited because they can. Yeah. And you really have to tell the difference. And, you know, the, for the people who are just mean for mean sake, it's like, okay, thank you. Bye. You know? Yeah. Because you're not going to do it. You're never ever going to do anything that is going to make them happy anyways. It's not so much. If someone were to say to me, you suck. Okay. Why? Yeah. Sure. Everyone's got their opinion. You think I suck. Tell me why. What, yeah. what is it that was not good? So that way I know how to fix it. And I keep, I, I don't get comments like that. And that's what kind of scares me is I've been doing this since 2019 and I've yet to have anyone in person or comment wise or whatever it is say anything negative. So I'm really nervous because mm -hmm. I feel like uh, there's, I'm, I'm really critical of myself, you know, and uh, that, that scene I filmed for Vance for a fan film he's working on. I did several takes of that. And the one that was used, I, th I think was, was the best of the takes, but I still feel like I could have done it better. There's something about it where, you know, you want to put in that effort, you want it to be perfect and you see it and you get positive feedback, but then you don't believe it still. Like, yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that. But in your head, you're thinking, I don't know. Do I, do I believe that? Because I feel like I could have done it so much better. And it's, it's not so much that it was a thought after the fact it's what, what I was thinking right then and there Yeah, with all those takes thinking, okay, I can do this better. Did what I thought was better. I see it edited, edited into, you know, what that scene is going to be and still saying, mm, you know, I don't know. You, you've just discovered the difference between stage and film stage. There's another performance tomorrow night at eight o'clock. We'd love to have you there. And if there's something <laughs> wrong with the performance, we fix it. Film. Once you have that cut, it's forever, baby. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And you just, you just use that. You just use that to channel it for next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and you were talking about like somebody just saying, you know, you suck or whatever, you know, uh, that's, that's another thing of discerning criticism. You know, some, there are fan film series that don't allow comments on their videos. Right. Um, I leave that open. And the policy that I've always had is if somebody is making a, a contribution to a conversation. So if they're coming in and they're saying, well, how come, how come they didn't use the tractor beam there or something? You know what I mean? Like if they're mm -hmm. making a point, yeah, I, I leave that there and I may answer it. I may address it. We kept getting a comment on one film that was like, wow, it took security way too long to respond when that Klingon beamed aboard. And I'm like, it took them 90 seconds like what are you talking about like it took them too long they were there in 90 seconds i, I was too too long and so it's just like people believe that for a reason you know i you know yeah, that there's, 30 deck, there's 30 decks on an old connie and a 400 <laughs> yeah. plus person crew i mean what he was stationed I, I, somebody and i was just like i was just like <laughs> what do you people just like expect that the Security officers are just going to materialize instantly in in this person's quarters, but we only carry bit is that 
It's what people Security think. And, and so it's like, if, if they're making a point, if they're saying how, uh, what happened? Why did she stop wearing the wig in the last scene? You know, whatever it is, you know, like that's, that's a conversation. But if, but my policy is if somebody just does a drive by and they're like bad acting, terrible acting, embarrassing, this is horrible. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves, whatever it is. I just delete that because it adds nothing to the conversation. Hey, right. Awesome. What are you doing? It's, it's not, it's not informative. It doesn't give a critique. Right. It's not helpful. Yeah. Right. Which is something, this you is, know, I, I tell my first year students, you know, you have to write a critique. A critique is not telling me that, it, that I stepped in, in poo because anybody can tell me that. Mm -hmm. Tell me how to avoid or how to change. So my first year students learn how to write a critique. Three things you like, three things you would change. Even if, if it's a perfect production, three things you would change. That's right. critique, right? right. It's, it's the art of seeing I love you. how that dynamic can change right. rather than just saying, Stop. yeah, that's, not. that's, that's, that's not critique. That's nope. just so bad. Know. Sorry. I got my six year old in here and he's, yeah, my nine year olds running around here too. So. <laughs> they they want to be stars, right? Yeah. Well, I'll I'll let you guys to your family. I was gonna gonna wrap up, let you guys off the hook so that you don't end up spending your entire day with me. But this was great. <laughs> I really like meeting you guys, Joshua and Paul. You guys just really helped just continue to to reaffirm that the fan film community for Star Trek is a great community to be a part of. And yes, it is. let's, let's do this. I'd like for you guys to tell us, to tell me in our audience what you're working on now or what's coming up and how we can follow you and, and see that and be able to, to view your work. Well, I'm um, next up for us. We're editing uh, pony express, which is our fourth episode uh, in the first season. So that should probably drop in about a month. So it'll make uh, three full episodes this year. And that is on No Budget Productions. That's on Vance's channel. Okay. So No Budget Productions, search for that on YouTube. Yeah, just Rain Cross. Yeah. If you, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Joshua, how about you? Okay. So for Avalon Universe, um, sometime in the next four weeks, we're going to release our film Crisis on Infinite Excaliburs, which is a... Uh, a film I've wanted to do since the beginning, uh, really started thinking about in, in 2019. Uh, it's been a journey getting, getting to the point where it's almost done, but it's almost done. You'll be able to see it sometime in the next month. Not sure exactly what day, but, um, it's, it's so close. You know, we can, we can feel it. And then after that, um, probably a couple of months later, we're going to, we're going to do another tales from the neutral zone that's called. Le Mort de Gare. I think I'm pronouncing that right. That's a, it's, you know, kind of a French adaptation. Um, there was a, an old story about King Arthur, Le Mort de Arthur, so the death mm -hmm. of Arthur. And so this is the death of war. And it's a crossover between Avalon and Tales from the Neutral Zone. Uh, right. it's shot. It's ready to go. We're working on post on that as well. And then next year, uh, don't know when, might be July, might be Halloween. We're going to have the Avalon Universe finale of the, the core story. Yeah. <laughs> it is the best. <laughs> we're we're going to have, uh, the, the film is going to be called The Once and Future Captain. That film is shot. It's produced. It's just a matter of, of getting to post with that. But what I'm what I'm also working on is, you know, the positivity in this community, you know, you mentioned that, and it's an important thing. This is a fan film community that is coming together and it's a really, really beautiful thing to watch happen because for so long, it wasn't like that. You know, you'd hear people just say, Oh, there's so much drama in Star Trek fan films. Well, the other thing that I would hear on sets is imagine what we could all do if we just work together. I would hear so many people say that. And now that's something that's really starting to happen. People working on each other's projects, people being supportive of each other's projects. It is really becoming a positive community. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely excellent. Yes, it is. I, I see that. And welcome to the community, Jefferson. We're really glad you're here. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. That is great, guys. And I'm going to 
be a part of the community. I like talking with you guys and fan film creators. It's something that is going to be a regular thing. And uh, Vance and Frank and I are going to be starting up this thing. It's a weekly review of fan films. And it's something that they've they've wanted to do. And I said, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Let's let's sit down and, and review a fan film. So that way we can we can help each other get get that exposure and get our things looked at and seen. And for those in the community that maybe hadn't heard of or seen a, predict, a particular film, well, now you'll want to go seek it out because it, it got a it got a review. And uh, we're going to call, we're calling that show critical, not cynical. Yep. There we go. So yeah, there you go. You got it. Well, guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for welcoming me to the community. I love it. Absolutely. Going to be seeing more of you guys and doing everything I can to help and get in there. So you guys have a <laughs> nice good. night and live long and prosper. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support us at patreon.com slash beyond Trek. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.